justify prove to be right or reasonable justification is at the heart of all legal and political argument but at a time when argument itself is slave to appearances it is time to bring back a culture of justification justify a podcast on law and politics in india from the vidhi center for legal policy hosted by orgo sen gupta Hello and welcome to Justify. This is our ninth episode and it's titled Blackout, where we discuss the communications lockdown in Jammu and Kashmir and the Supreme Court judgment, which laid down the principles that future lockdowns will have to follow, but didn't provide any remedies for the Kashmir situation. I'll be joined in a little bit by Chintan Chandrachur, who's an author and a lawyer, to discuss the case. But before that, our roundup of cases from last week. First, in Desh Raj v. Bal Kishan, the Supreme Court tackled the inordinate problem of judicial delays that plagues our judiciary. Now, delays is a question that I think is the original sin of the Indian judiciary. More than any other issue, whether it be appointment of judges or substantive questions relating to law, secularism, religion, freedoms, duties, it's delays which imperils the justice system. In Deshraj v. Balkishan, a manifestation of this question in a single case came up before the Supreme Court. In the Civil Procedure Code, there is a requirement that all written statements, that is a response that is filed by the respondents, is filed in a period of 90 days. In this case, the response had not been filed in a period of five months, despite more than four opportunities being given to the person, at which point of time the Civil Court struck off the right to file a written statement. A person who couldn't file a written statement, despite five months, however, did marshal the resources to come to the Supreme Court and said that he was being denied justice. The Supreme Court rightly said that though the provision in the CPC for 90 days is directory, which means that it is not binding, and the Supreme Court can, or the High Court can, if necessary, extend this period This could not lead to wanton delays. Thus, the court laid down very firmly that there should be cultivated a culture of respecting deadlines, the time of the court, its officers, as well as its adversaries. However, when it came to applying the law to this case, the court took a lenient view and allowed a written statement to be filed within a week from the order of the Supreme Court. I wish the court had walked its talk and given the remedy that the law pointed to rather than take a lenient view. It's these lenient views that unfortunately come together and lead us to the massive delays that our system faces today. In KM Singh versus the Honorable Speaker of the Manipur Legislative Assembly, the court was faced with yet another question of defection. Mr. T. Sham Kumar Singh was a legislator who was voted in to power on a ticket of the Indian National Congress, but when the BJP staked its claim to form the government, he switched sides. When the defection matter was raised before the Speaker of the Legislative Assembly, and as many as 13 applications were filed before the Speaker, the Speaker didn't take a decision. So a writ petition was ultimately filed before the Manipur High Court to direct the Speaker to decide the applications within a reasonable period of time. And the matter then came up to the Supreme Court as to whether it is within the power of the Court to direct the Speaker in this manner. Please note that the Constitution says that in terms of procedural matters, the Speaker's decision is final and so cannot be reviewed by the Court. The Court held in this case that the refusal to take a decision by the Speaker 
was a matter that could be reviewed by the court and the court could direct the speaker to take a decision because it was his constitutional duty to do so simply by not taking a decision the speaker could not evade a question of defection the gentleman still continues as a minister in the manipur legislative assembly and taking note of that fact the supreme court directed the speaker to decide the matter in four weeks time failing which it would take the matter up again this is how the law should be applied to the facts and the court did a terrific job in this case in hanuman lakshman aroskar versus the union of india this was a sequel to an earlier case by the same name where the supreme court had struck down the environmental clearance that had been granted to the building of a second airport in goa the court had directed the eac that's the expert committee that looks at environmental clearances to take into account certain facts that it had not looked into the last time specifically the forests and other ecologically sensitive areas that lay within 10 kilometers of the proposed airport the eac had looked into those matters and had concluded that the forests and other ecologically sensitive areas not being within 6 kilometers of the airport and also being north and south of the proposed airport did not cause a significant problem this is because the runway of the new airport ran east to west these were important facts that the court noted so that the eac has taken into account and it appointed another body neri to oversee the implementation of its directions it made sure that both the statutory authority as well as the authority it appointed in order to ensure compliance both follow the letter and spirit of the environmental laws of our country this is a matter which shows what role the courts can play in matters relating to the environment it need not trample upon executive authority and discretion while at the same time not giving anybody a free pass this is the level of scrutiny that we need by the courts in environmental cases where they don't decide the matter which is not within their competence but make sure that decisions are taken on the right grounds finally to a high court case this week this is an interesting case that comes out of the allahabad high court yet another one around the caa and its protests The Allahabad High Court treated a letter written by an advocate of the Bombay High Court Ajay Kumar as a public interest litigation. The letter pointed to two news articles, one from the New York Times and one from the Telegraph, both of which pointed to the complete breakdown of the rule of law in Uttar Pradesh. The one in New York Times, for example, spoke about the incidents in the town of nagina where after friday prayers ended certain individuals were protesting against the new citizenship law when severe violence erupted thousands of police officers were deployed who brutally cracked down on the protesters and based on witness accounts it reported that as many as 100 individuals were detained and beaten by bamboo sticks by the police and the witnesses also showed reporters deep bruises the allahabad high court took cognizance of this it didn't frame any issues but noted that there were several facts that were not in dispute including that an incident had taken place on december 20th where people had both lost their lives as well as suffered injury and huge damage was caused to public property it said that to maintain the faith of the people in the rule of law it would have to direct the state to get information and present it before the court the information would relate to details of persons who were killed in police action in different parts of the state post mortem reports of those persons details of injured persons the number of arrests made number of complaints made to the police and against the police 
and the details of the medical aid provided. The court has directed the 17th of February to be the next date for hearing. This is a tough one because it's really not a matter that courts ought to intervene in, given that it's beyond both their legitimacy and competence. But when there is such a breakdown of the rule of law, it is a question to ponder, particularly for judicial conservatives like myself, as to whether the court can simply sit and watch as the nation erupts. That's a much longer debate, which we'll have on a future occasion. In my deep dive today, we look at the communications lockdown in Kashmir and the Supreme Court judgment, which came recently, that has laid down the law for lockdowns. We all know that on the 4th of August 2019, there was a complete communications lockdown and internet shutdown in the state of Jammu and Kashmir. This was prior to the announcement on the 5th of August that Article 370 would be nullified and the state of Jammu and Kashmir would be converted into two union territories. Anuradha Bhaseen, the editor of the Kashmir Times, came to the Supreme Court alleging that a fundamental right to free speech was being affected because of the shutdown and simply because no reporting was possible without access to the internet or access to telephone communication. The Supreme Court, in a judgment five months later, held that the right to free speech on the internet and the right to trade and commerce on the internet is a fundamental right. This is a big declaration from the Supreme Court and one that will be of use in future cases. However, quite inexplicably, the court said that the right to access the internet is not a fundamental right because it was not argued in this case. Now, at one level, if someone does have a right to free speech on the internet, then one would assume that that right would be completely infructuous if one didn't have a right to access the internet in the first place. So whether the right to access the internet is implicit in the right to free speech or not is an open question that is unfortunately left for a future day. Having held that the right to free speech on the internet is a fundamental right, it also held, rightly, that any restriction on the fundamental right would have to satisfy the doctrine of proportionality. In layman's terms, it would have to be reasonable, it would have to be necessary, and there ought to be no less restrictive means by which this goal could be achieved. Now, let's break this down. So, the court has to be satisfied that the lockdown is necessary and there is no less restrictive means of ensuring national security than a complete lockdown. That is based on the assumption that every single message that every person sends as well as every single point of accessing the internet could be a threat to national security. Now, it doesn't take a legal scholar to say that this is an impossible burden to discharge. No one can make the claim that every single action on the internet in Kashmir could be a threat to national security. So while the court, and we must laud the court, for being progressive in laying down the law so clearly, Unfortunately, it is hypocritical in not applying the law to the facts and circumstances of the case. As my guest, Chintan Chandrachur, has written, this is a case of judicial abdication, that there is a complete refusal to apply proportionality, and instead it is left to the government to take the law into account and apply it in a period of seven days through a review of the shutdown. Now, while that is encouraging in one respect that at least the government is forced to look into its actions, one wishes that the court did this because that is the job of the court. Second, Rule 7 of the Telecom Suspension Rules, which allows telecom services to be suspended, says that it must 
follow section 5 subsection 2 of the Indian Telegraph Act. For the uninitiated, this section allows phone tapping or interception, prohibition or detaining of messages or a class of messages. Please note, the important thing is what you can tap is a message or a class of messages. In this case, what was suspended was not one person's account, not one type of account, not one service provider, but all of the internet. The court justifies it by saying that a blanket ban is not per se violative of Article 191A. It cites examples of books which have been banned and films that have been banned. But there is a crucial logical fallacy here. A ban on a book is like a ban on a website on the internet. A ban on the internet itself is like a ban on books. Now that, to my mind, has never been accepted as constitutional in any liberal democracy in the world. And so the court having sanctioned a communications lockdown that is so total and pervasive, I think is unfortunate. And the fact that it did not apply the law as beautifully as it laid out to the facts of the case makes one wish that the court did better. Again, as I've said, this is a difficult question for judicial conservatives like myself because we do want a certain degree of deference that the court has towards parliament and towards the executive government, particularly in questions such as national security, economic policy and other matters that are really not within the competence of the court. But there is a fine line between deference and abdication. And unfortunately, it is my view that the court in Anuradha Masin's case is on the wrong side of this line. To discuss this and much more, my guest today is Chintan Chandrachur. Chintan is a lawyer who works in London and in his free time, which I think he has a bit of or he's in immensely disciplined, writes constitutional law books, particularly those aimed at a lay audience. Thanks very much, Chintan, for joining me today. It's good to be with you. Right. So before we get to the topic of the lockdown, something that's always uh, impressed me quite a bit is that you have a full time job at a law firm. And at the same time, you manage to churn out book after book. What's the secret to your success? There's uh, there's no real secret. I spend Monday to Friday working on commercial law and tax cases and Saturday and Sunday working on constitutional law and public law. So is will I be right in assuming that you get so bored every Friday <laughs> <laughs> that that's what keeps you going through the weekend? <laughs> it's good to be able to do different things. Um, I think the, the advantage of doing two things which are fairly different is that you never get bored as such because you're always looking forward to working on something which is different to what you did yesterday. Fair enough. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about the book that's just come out. You've written a second book, The Cases That India Forgot. Yes. It seems very interesting. It seems like it's written for a general audience that's interested in the law, much like a lot of our listeners of this podcast. So tell us a little bit about the book. Sure. So the book is called The Cases That India Forgot. It's published by Jagannath. Um, and the aspiration of the book is to increase civil society engagement with the law and the constitution. Uh, what I do in the book is to essentially discuss and analyze 10 cases that are not in the public consciousness, uh, but that I say should be. And these cases are divided into four themes, which are gender, politics, religion, and national security. Okay, so that's actually a very interesting set of cases. And for those of you who haven't read the book, I strongly urge that you pick it up. It uh, told me, for example, several things about the Keshav Singh judgment uh, that I didn't know. I knew the fact that this was one of these 
altercations for the ages between the legislature and the court, but a lot of interesting nuggets about cases that we as lawyers often tend to miss. Yes. So, so it's a great book. I'm looking forward to reading all of it and congratulations for publishing it. But uh, moving from the cases that India forgot to perhaps what I describe as a case that hopefully India might forget. Yes. <laughs> the case of the internet shutdown on Radha Bhaseen versus the Union of India. So you written an Indian Express article, Chintan, yes. recently on the case where you said, and I quote, in deciding the case, the Supreme Court would have been expected to undertake three tasks. The first was to expound upon the relevant rules and principles. You say yes. that they have done this robustly. Now, while certainly there are many robust statements, don't you think that to be truly a robust enunciation of principle, perhaps a principle that they could have laid down is that the proportionality doctrine can never be satisfied by a blanket internet shutdown. Um, yes, so they've, they've done that to some extent. So what the court has said is, the court has said one important thing about proportionality, which is that proportionality is a doctrine that is to be applied not merely by the courts, but also by the review committee and essentially the executive branch of government that addresses or deals with these suspension orders. So that's the starting point. What they've also said is that an indefinite communications blackout order will never comply with the proportionality test. In other words, you can't have an order that does not provide for a specific timeline um, and has a one-stop review process and just continues to apply indefinitely. Uh, what the court has not said, you, you're right to suggest that the court has not indicated that a full blackout fails the proportionality test. Uh, but I, I don't have too much of, the pro of, of a problem with that. Mm -hmm. And the reason for this is as follows. Even if the court were to say that a blanket ban, a blanket blackout fails proportionality, there will nevertheless continue to be arguments about what the width of the blanket is. This is the trouble with um, the blanket terminology that we find from time to time. So say, for instance, they were to impose the ban all across the state. So a ban on 2G, on Internet, on mobile services all across the state. You might well describe that as a blanket ban. On the other hand, if they select a portion of the state but impose the very same substantive ban across that portion of the state, that might well itself be considered a blanket ban. Um, and so therefore, I think it's, it's helpful to analyze proportionality from case to case. And so I think the starting point of the, the, the court uses is correct. Um, where I was disappointed is the fact that the court fails to apply that principle in practice. Okay, so let's come to that yes. in uh, a little later, but let's continue on this question of principle. Hmm. Uh, what you said is interesting that, of course, the court wants the government to apply proportionality in passing a suspension order in the first place or even while imposing Section 144 of the CRPC. And that's great, but that at the end of the day is something that one would expect governments to do when the court is interpreting the position of law in a particular way. But the second point, which is about this blanket ban issue. Now, I actually see it very differently. I see a blanket ban as meaning a blanket shutdown of the internet right. without distinguishing between types of services on the internet. Sure. So uh, whether it's blanket geographical or not, that's a separate issue. But in the example that you gave, so if there was a blanket ban in terms of a complete shutdown of the internet in Srinagar, I would say that that also qualifies as a blanket ban. Now, and here's where I my problem with saying that a blanket ban may be okay proportionality wise because then it seems that you're making an implicit assumption that every activity that is carried out on the internet whether it be someone saying something or someone buying something or even accessing a news article is in some way detrimental to the objective you seek to achieve so in pure proportionality terms, my sense is that 
while it would certainly fail the necessity test, it would perhaps also fail the rational connection test because we won't be able to show that what every single person in Kashmir or Srinagar or anywhere in the world for that matter, wherever the ban is, every single person who's doing something on the internet is actually in some way militating against the objective you're seeking to achieve. Sure, I, I, I agree with you to a certain extent, but not completely. Um, I agree with you to the extent that if a blanket ban and blanket being defined in the way that you describe it um, is is imposed, a high burden of justification, if you like, must be placed on the government to demonstrate that the ban is necessary and the proportionality test would be very hard to justify or to get through. I don't know whether I would necessarily take it to the extent of saying that a blanket ban would never satisfy the proportionality test. Mm. Um, it might be that you would envisage a situation. Let's say, for example, you have a situation where a complete block of the internet is placed in one of the cities in the state or one town in the state for a period of two hours. Mm. So on that definition, on your definition, that would nevertheless be a blanket ban. Mm. But there may be a justification for it. And the intrusion on the right, given its limited time frame, is far more limited in that mm. case. Now, even in that scenario, I'm not saying that the government should necessarily be able to get through easily. Mm. There needs to be a good justification for it. But one might be available. Yeah, yeah, because my sense is that, okay, I hear you partly that yeah. if there is a technological justification that yes. we can't do it in this way, maybe yeah. Yeah, that it's not possible to narrowly tailor it to, say, a particular messaging service. Right. Maybe I get that point. But I don't know. As in, if it's technologically possible, it seems that perhaps the government needs to narrowly tailor their restrictions a bit more. Uh, but I agree with your point that the burden should be perhaps so high that it will be difficult to discharge. Absolutely. Uh, but if I come to the other point that you were making about uh, court asking the government to ensure that it considers proportionality in making its orders. Now, in some sense, it seems a bit like a suspended declaration or a declaration of incompatibility, something you had right. written about in your first book right. quite a bit. But in some senses, it's also different because a suspended declaration says that we perhaps will strike it down yeah. uh, if you don't correct ABC in accordance with our, our judgment. Right. But in this case, the court does something slightly different. Right. It simply tells the government to take a first crack at it yes. without saying as to what they think about the actual application of the law to the facts in this case. Now, do you think the court then fundamentally gets it the wrong way around? As if it does it and applies the law to the facts, then the government hopefully in the future will keep following it. Yeah. But the court just seems to tell the government to, you know, take a first crack at it. Absolutely. I think I think that's where the problem lies. The key issue here is to understand where, um, if you like, the burden of inertia lies. Now, remember the court, when deciding this case, has a remedial toolbox at its disposal. It, it doesn't have simply the option of either strike down or uphold. There's a wide range of remedies available at its disposal. And it could, for example, have said that the government will have another crack at this. Uh, however, these are our prima facie views, and if the government doesn't take certain steps within a period of X days, these orders are disappearing, for instance. The court doesn't do that. What it in fact does is to lay down the principles, uh, to not apply those principles to the orders that are before them, but to rather than move the first task of applying those principles to the government, and for subsequent adjudication to then arise before the court. Um, I am all for the idea of the government engaging in an exercise of constitutional review. Um, in my view, that can only be a good thing, and I think all governments should be made to do it. Uh, the court could well have achieved the very same objective that it has achieved in this case by making its decision in respect of the orders that were before them, if they didn't have the orders calling for the orders before them, and then laying down the set of principles and saying that going forward, the government must now apply the principles that we've set out in this judgment. 
um, in the first instance. But of course, we can always take a second look, if you like, and decide whether the government has done so appropriately or not. Um, in this instance, they fail to uh, they fail to do that. Absolutely, and I think that would have been sensible. So, what do you think possibly explains this failure? Um, I think well. So, if you were to read the judgment, there is no categorical explanation as to why the court has chosen to expound upon the principles but not apply them in practice. Uh, but you can infer a few reasons from the judgment as to why the court may have decided not to do so. One of them was the fact that there were a series of orders, and these are both suspension orders, that's orders suspending the internet services, as well as section 144 orders suspending physical access um, in place. And the nature uh, and scope of these orders changed over time. And so initially the government said, uh, the government attempted to claim privilege in respect of these orders. Its position, as I understand it, then changed. And it said, well, we don't quite claim privilege, but the orders are in fact so complicated and they change so much over time that we are unable to produce the orders to you. Um, the court really need not have taken that at, at face value. In fact, it doesn't take it at face value. It says that the government ought to have produced the orders, but curiously enough, doesn't ask the government to do so. Uh, the court just simply takes the government's failure at its word um, and says that rather than asking the government now to produce the orders, we're going to ask them to go back to the drawing board and conduct the review exercise themselves. That's that's one part of it. The second part of it is, is something to, that we've to some extent alluded to, which is that it should be the government that has the first crack um, at conducting a review of these orders which I agree with in principle, but as we've said, there was no harm in the court expounding upon the principles, applying them and asking the government to apply them in future cases. That's right. And that's why actually this is, I often find that this is a difficult case for me because I, I personally think that I'm all for judicial deference and not trampling over uh, the separation of powers doctrine, getting into territories which are not traditionally functions of the court, but there seems to be a line that's been crossed here. And you rightly say that this is perhaps a case of abdication. Yeah. Now, where do you think that line is between deferring to the government, allowing the government to take a crack at something first and abdicating your responsibility as the highest court of the land? So I think there are two things to bear in mind here. The first is fundamentally, what is it that a court does when a case arises before it for hearing? Uh, a constitutional court such as the Supreme Court does two things. Number one, it decides the case on the facts before it, which is a backward looking exercise. And it also, in addition, prescribes the rules for the future as a constitutional court, which is a forward looking exercise. It's part of the court's role and responsibility to undertake both the forward-looking and the backward-looking exercise. And I'd say that both are equally important. You perhaps might even go to the extent of saying that the backward-looking exercise is more important. That's right. Because that explains to you how those exalted lofty principles are meant to be applied on the ground. Um, so that may well be part of the, that may well be part of it. Hmm. So then, uh, since the judges didn't do it, let's try and attempt this application of the law to the facts ourselves. So if you were put in a position where now you had to apply the law to the facts, it's, it seems a bit like a, sometimes like an exam question, yeah. actually, <laughs> because the judges have left this question begging. Uh, but if you were to do that, and if you were to take proportionality in terms of the three-part test, and to see whether the suspension orders issued in this case were proportionate or not. Uh, so do you think first that there is a legitimate goal that's to be achieved? Uh, yes, you might well say that there is a legitimate goal or a proper purpose to be achieved. That's right. So there is a, a good possibility uh, that the orders or one or more of the orders would pass the first part of the test. And the purpose being uh, national security and law and order. Exactly. Some, that's some, right. some such. That's yeah. right. 
Um, and the second limb would be, as it depends on which uh, sure. ex- exposition of proportionality right. you're using, but the second would be necessity. Right. As in, is there a less intrusive means of yes. achieving the same purpose? What would you say to that? Uh, that's the part of the test, or that's the limb of the test that is likely to be difficult to satisfy in practice. Um, and I think that would be difficult to satisfy on the basis of the width of the communications blackout. Now, let's remember that from the 4th of August onwards, you have a blackout for a period of five months. This is the the longest continuous blackout on the Internet in any democratic state. Um, This blackout is extremely broad. It covers broadband. It covers mobile Internet. It does not exempt essential services. It does not exempt hospitals. It does not exempt schools and so on. Um, And you could think of a variety of other alternatives where the government either draw either grant certain exceptions or provides Internet to everyone with certain large carve outs, Mm. which would achieve the same object. Like blocks certain sites, which they think might be more detrimental to national security than, say, a hospital. Exactly. Exactly. So it would possibly fail the necessity test, yes. in which case we don't really have to go to the third limb yes. of balancing the importance of the purpose vis-a-vis the interference with the rights. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So so I think that uh, there is a an element in your article in the Indian Express which uh, also seems to suggest that when this lack of application of the law to the facts is compounded by the fact that the decision comes nearly five months uh, after the 4th of August when the shutdown was ordered in the first place. And now you've given a further period to the government. uh, That that deferral really is what makes it seem like judicial abdication. Now, let's go to this question of delays in the Supreme Court because this is... This is not new, as in, as I was discussing with someone else recently, that delays have become very prominent in the Supreme Court. By, and by delays here, I don't mean regular delays, but delays in listing of important mm-hmm. matters. But this is not new. Uh, even today, the matter relating to the constitutionality of the breakup of Andhra Pradesh, which happened in 2011, has not been listed. Okay. For people from Bombay, they'll know that there's a property owners association case, which was an SLP that I think was filed in 1992, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, again, challenging Article 31B, which has not been listed. There are several other cases which have not been listed. So what do you think perhaps explains this? Is perhaps the Supreme Court a more political institution than we'd like to believe? Um, I don't think that it's necessarily politics that explains it. I think it's an absence of clarity about priorities. That's the difficulty. Um, The court has undoubtedly taken on a huge amount within its docket. Um, it's clear to me that there are some issues and some cases that need to be prioritized and dealt with with much more alacrity than others. Now, remember one thing, this case is distinctive from many others uh, because the lapse of time prejudices the petitioner's case virtually irreparably. So after the lapse of five months, let's assume that the court were even to grant a remedy and were to say that all of these orders or some of these orders uh, were disproportionate and should therefore be struck down, your remedy is really effectively only forward-looking. You can't compensate for the loss of internet for a period of five months. So then let me quickly follow up, because the thought then that strikes me is that then perhaps the orders should have had an interim stay, because the balance of convenience is in favor of the petitioners, that there is really no way you can turn the clock back on something like this. So what do you think explains this hesitation to stay? uh, And in this case, unlike the CAA, where this question of the stay has come up most recently, where the court can 
perhaps say that this was a statute and we rarely and courts have rarely stayed parliamentary statutes though it has happened i don't know how justified that would be i personally think you would not be justified but in this case it was an executive enactment it was an order passed by a committee right. uh, what do you think explains this hesitation to stay an enactment of this kind um my sense is that the explanation lies in the n word and what i mean by that is national security um and the concern from the court whether legitimate or not but remember this is something which is very hard to test you only test it when you do it and when you do it and it goes wrong it can result in disastrous consequences and i think it's a fear of those potential consequences that has resulted in the court choosing not to stay the order now my concern with the court's judgment is not so much the time that it has taken i would grant the court and i suspect many others would grant the court a period of 5 right. months to decide the case there were multiple hearings before the court there were several hearings due process does take time the government needs to be given an opportunity to respond and the like i would even go to the extent of saying that it would have been perfectly acceptable for the court to take an additional month if it wanted to in order to secure the orders from the government and to understand precisely which orders were in place and when i think what was lacking in this judgment was creativity for instance one of the things that the court could have considered doing is to tell the government to maintain a status quo in respect of the orders in so far as it does not involve imposing orders that are more draconian than the orders that are currently in place so the court could have said tell us what the position was as on x date pick august 4th pick january 1st any date you like don't make the orders any more draconian than they already are you're welcome to make them less draconian and to loosen the internet restrictions if you like but we will test the constitutionality of the orders as at that date okay. so there were a number of options available to the court but the court was not as creative as it ought to have yeah and i think you're right on that as an i say think sometimes as in our social media storm we tend to get carried away by the fact that there must be some uh malicious intentions behind not listing of certain matters i think the truth is uh, far less evocative and far simpler is that the court does have a really full docket mm. and it sometimes might take time to list matters i do think that what the court does with the matters when it is before them is of far more significant importance than uh, how long it really takes i don't think we are at that stage yet so let's end with one point which has troubled me quite a bit which is this idea of secret orders okay. the fact is that it seems to me that the very an- antithesis of the rule of law is to have a secret order as there is no such thing as in if you go back to fuller as in this is legality 101 yeah. that you must know what the order is you must know what the law is and only then can you say that ignorance of law is not an excuse because you must know what it is in this case given the fact that so many of the orders could not even be produced by the government don't you think that there is some fundamental ground that this is violative of the rule of law that orders need to be published and i understand that there was no publication requirement in that particular rule but perhaps the court might have read that in so the court has indicated that at least going forward um suspension orders ought to be published and should be published even the even though there is no express publication rule what it ought to have done in this instance is to secure the publication of the orders that have not been published so far mm-hmm. now let's remember that open justice is a fundamental principle of an adversarial system a system effectively where both sides are required to collect their own evidence and present the best case based on that evidence um and the way in which it handicapped the petitioners for instance in this case is that they were left with challenging a panoply of orders that undoubtedly overlap both in time in geographical application in scope without having access to those orders 
problems. And to do that is a, a difficult or, or ambitious proposition. Yeah, that seems to me to be a travesty, but one can hope with this judgment that given the fact that it has laid down the principles that we want to be laid down for uh, the rule of law and free speech, uh, that it will certainly improve things in times to come. Unfortunately, it really hasn't improved things for Anuradha Bhaseen and the other petitioners in this particular case. But like everyone else, we hope for better. Thanks very much, Chintan, for joining me today. It was a real pleasure having you. A pleasure. Thanks, Orgo. Thanks. Time for Clatter, our legal quiz that's a bit tougher than clat. But we had an easy question last week and many of you got the right answer. The legislation of parliament that is avowedly for the purposes of health measures and eugenics is the Medical Termination of Pregnancy Act 1971. Many got the answer right. Our winner this time is Jeevita. Congratulations for the right answer and an Amazon gift voucher awaits. Time for this week's quiz. This is a bit tough, so listen in. This paramilitary force has a mountain goat as its symbol. It was one of the earliest paramilitary forces which, led by Major Brown, had declared its independence from India, despite the fact that the princely state that it was a part of had acceded to India. It's now a part of the Pakistani army. Which paramilitary force are we talking about? Do send in your answers to justify at vidhilegalpolicy.in. Right answers stand a chance to win an Amazon gift voucher for a thousand rupees. Thanks very much for tuning in to this episode of Justify. Looking forward to having you in future weeks. Adjourned. If you enjoyed listening to this podcast, follow us on Twitter at Vidhi underscore India for regular updates. Follow us on Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, or any other podcast channel that you know to tune in to our next episode. Email us at justify at vithilegalpolicy.in to share your comments and feedback on this episode. We look forward to hearing from you.